Good evening. Thank you, Henry. Huh. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna stand here. I'm gonna preach <laughs> over here. For those who know me, my name is Franco. I'm the executive leader in Eurasian Chuane Hafeld, uh, under Marina's our senior leader. I have been part of this congregation for 15 years, or this church. And I started off in Linwood, and then I was in South Downs, and then I went back to Linwood, and now I'm back in Hafeld. I feel like I'm living the book Circles in a Forest. But 15 years ago, as I came to Every Nation in a vocational call to ministry, I had my first lessons in stewardship. Because when you step into ministry, they tell you it's fantastic, you're going to get a salary of X, let's say 10,000 Rand, and you have to go raise that 10,000 Rand, and you've got to share the vision and call people to partner with you financially on a monthly basis, and that's going to be your salary. Yay. Count the cost of full-time call. But that taught me how to steward my finances. Up all that time, I'd gotten uh, a salary, but I, I lived through all of it. But having to, to come before God in faith for your salary taught me how to steward my finances. And so I thought that stewardship. And then fast forward a couple of years, I meet a fantastic woman that says yes. God knows why. And so we get married, and we have two kids. And that first kid, Kai, uh, is a blessing. <laughs> yes, he, his name literally means uh, unbreakable fire worship of God, and he's true to his name. <laughs> but uh, about three months in, we, we, we send something's wrong, and so we go to the specialist, and at three months, that young baby boy has to go into a theater to get a liver biopsy. And so we get the, the news that he already has cirrhosis on his liver. And unless a miracle happens, I have to give half of my liver to my son. And so we call on the elders to come and pray, which the word says is their job and their duty. And at a clock on a weeknight, Donnie and, and Louis from Linwood rocks up at our house, forsaking their family time to lay hands on my son and pray. But before they pray, Louis looks me in the eye and he says, are you okay if Kai dies? I'm like, what? <laughs> That's not the part. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you, you come and tell me that. You come and pray for healing. And he says, no, but realize that he's not your son first. He belongs to God. And you're only stewarding his life. Oh, whole new level of stewardship. And then realizing from there that there's so much to stewardship, it's not just money. How do we steward our relationships? This morning I asked married people, if your wife is under a lot of pressure and she's battling and she's struggling to, to balance work and kids and you, can you create room for her to breathe as a husband? Nadalyn, we create room for our wives to breathe. But wives, when your husband is carrying the spiritual weight of the family and he's providing and is a good husband, can you maybe just let go of the fact that he hasn't changed that light bulb yet? I just give him some space and just love on him and respect him. What about your studies, your work? If, you pay, if you're being paid for 40 hours a week, are you giving 40 hours a week? Are you stewarding what God has given you? And so we can go every single aspect of our life. I mean, how are you stewarding this? How are you stewarding the church? If there's a technical issue, now we have fantastic people at the back tonight, but sometimes we have to raise new people. If the slides are a little behind when we worship, do you get irritated? If there's a little feed when I walk this way, that sometimes happens, because maybe the gains are a little bit high. Can you maybe first have grace and think maybe that guy, that person, that 
that fantastic woman behind the desk is there for the first time. And they've decided to steward a part of the church. Can we approach them with grace and help? What the gospel? How are you doing stewarding the gospel? If God has called you to share and invite people into this family so that we don't have orphans like we sang, how are you doing with that? Are you stewarding the gospel? And then money. So it's taken us four weeks in stewardship, but now we're getting to money tonight. And so what I usually do is I take one piece of scripture and I break that open. Today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a couple of scriptures. Because I want the word to speak for itself. Because there's this fantastic flow throughout the word. And there's a couple of things that flow from the word, but I'm going to show you one of those things tonight. And I hope it blesses you because it blessed me. Because when I saw it, it was like looking at my wife for the first time. I had to go, oh my gosh. This is really beautiful. And so we're going to start in Matthew, principle one. You cannot be righteous without being generous. Jesus is sitting on a mountain, speaking to a group quite like this, just one or two more, one or two thousand more. And he's, he's, he's giving his first sermon. It's called the Beatitudes. And in verse six of Matthew five, he says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. Now this begs a couple of questions, so I want to I encourage you to, to stop. Don't just read the word, stop, ask questions. I mean, in this case, what does blessed mean? What does righteousness mean? What is Jesus' context of those two words? And, and why, if he's speaking about righteousness, he's talking about hunger and thirst. Well, the first thing is, that word blessed, we sang it in that first song. Oh, bless my soul. It's the word ashri, bless my soul. In this case, you sang baruch. Baruch means just exactly that, just bless the Lord of my soul, bless my soul. It's just when there's blessing inferred. This word ashri means to have a content and filled life because we make the right decisions. You want a happy life? Be blessed, make the right decisions. And then the word for righteousness is interesting. That word of righteousness means tzedak. Can you guys say tzedak? Tzedak. Now say tzedaka. Ah. Righteousness tzedak. Generosity tzedaka. Can you see it has the same root word? They are bound together in scripture. There are 2,106 verses that pull those two together in the Bible. Those are more verses than heaven, hell, faith, and prayer combined. This is an important concept. Can you see why I loved when I saw this thing for the first time? You cannot be righteous unless you are generous before God. And what does it mean about the hunger and thirsty? Jesus is playing with words. He's literally saying, you want to be happy in life? You want to be content? Then hunger and thirst to feed those that are hunger and thirsty, and you will never hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst for those that are hunger and thirsty, and you will never hunger and thirst. You want to be righteous, be generous. Give to those that can't give anything back. You want to be blessed, bless other people. Make the right choices. See, the Jews believe that all personal wealth is on loan from God. Loan. So they practice tzedakah. Because everybody, everything belongs to God and we don't own anything. We are generous because it's not ours. It is God's. I'm going to share two verses that from those 2,106, one positive, one negative. One positive in Psalm 37 says, I was young and now I'm old. <laughs> Yet I've never seen the righteous that's the dark forsaken. 
All their children begging for bread. They are always tzedakah, generous, and they lend freely. Others will see that their children are blessed. I've never seen a righteous tzedak person forsaken. I've never seen their children hunger because they are tzedakah, they are generous. And people will even after them see that their children lack nothing. Isaiah 1 says the following. It says, you celebrate your new moons and your Sabbaths. This is what we're doing now. You celebrate your coming together. But when you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Why? Because your hands are full of blood. So what do we do? Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Please the ca- plead the case of the widow. So he's saying, we come together and we worship God. We raise our hands in worship. We pray towards God. We offer praise. And he says, I'm not listening. And he's, and he's so deeply affected by this, he says, there's blood on your hands and therefore I'm not listening. And the blood is the fact that we are not generous. That we are not living outside of ourselves to those that have less. Generosity is a major thing for our God that we serve. But why? Principle two, faith is demonstrated by love. Now here's a big thing. So if you go to campus, and I've done it a lot, you do the God test, and, and some, some of the students will say, well, I, I, I'm going to heaven. And you ask why? Because I believe in God. Sounds like a good answer. The problem is that James says that the demons also believe in God. So believing that Jesus exists only qualifies you to be a demon. (laughs) See, the problem is we have westernized our faith and we have linked our faith to doctrine, doctrine of the church, doctrine of the kingdom, doctrine of grace, doctrine of salvation. It's all about doctrines. And so we read the Bible, we study the doctrines, and then we believe. But the first century church, what doctrine did they have? This was a couple of years after Jesus left the earth. So what could they? Well, there was this guy called Jesus, uh, and he was God, and he walked among us, uh, but then we killed him. Uh, But that's okay, because he rose to life on the third day, proving that he was indeed God. And then he ate with us, and he fellowshiped with us, and we touched him, and we played some stuff, uh, and then for 40 days. And then he left, and he went to God, the Father. But he sent us the Holy Spirit. We're cool. That's literally the doctrine. See, they didn't have doctrine which to believe, to anchor their faith. What they have was acts of faith. And those acts of faith was love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, gave. For God so loved the world that he was tzedakah, that he was generous. And this is how the world will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. 1 John 3 uh, echoes the first. He says, this is how we know what love is. You want to know what love is? Here's it in the Bible. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. You know what love is? Love sacrifices. Love gives. That's love. You want to know if your boyfriend loves you? How much is he sacrificing? If he's not doing it, don't say yes when he asks you to marry him. Where is the two people that got engaged? It's not too late. Ask the question. (laughs) I'm loving it. (laughs) <laughs> and then he says the following on John 3 he says and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them how can the love of God be in that person there is not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth 1 John 3, 16 to 18. 
See, the first, first century church showed their, their faith but how they loved on people. If you read the book of Acts, it says that they had everything in common. They shared everything. No one had lack. And it says because of that, the church grew daily. Daily. People were added to the church daily because they saw the love of people. See, the world can come against us and, and, and say that Jesus isn't true and the Bible isn't true and this and that isn't true. But when we show love, when we give of ourselves to widows and orphans, when we fly into war zones to look after people, they can't deny that there's something more in us. Love is the purpose. In Matthew, Jesus tells a story. He says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. So what Jesus is, is talking to, to all those thousands of people, it's the last time He's speaking to them. After this, He's going to the upper room. He's going to spend some time with the 12 disciples. He's going to wash some feet and then He's going to get arrested. So this is the last words that He has to the crowd. And he says this, so there's a throne. He says, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Note yourself, when you get to heaven one day, move to your right. No. Move to your left. You want to be on Jesus' right. You want to be amongst the sheep, not the goats. Why? Because it says this in verse 34, it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed. Ashri, by my father. Take your inheritance. No orphans. We sang no orphans, right? An orphan does not have an inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. There's a kingdom that is your inheritance. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison, you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick in prison and go to visit you? Then the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So it's happening. The righteous on Jesus' right are asking him, but, you know, we, we, we did all of that. We fed people, we clothed them, we visited them, but we never saw you. He says, well, when you did that to them, you're doing that unto me. They don't know, but that's what Jesus says. Then he speaks to the goats. And he says the following, depart from me, you who are cursed, inheritance on the right, cursed on the left, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then he goes to the same list of six things. And then they have the same response. They say, you never knocked on my door. I never saw you in prison. What are we talking about? If, you, if, you, if I saw you, I would have given to you. But he says it's too late. You didn't show generosity to those that needed it and therefore not to me. So the point is, Matthew 7, just the chapter later, he says, in the end there will be many who say, Lord, Lord. And I will say, I do not know you. And, and those on the left will say, but, but we... we we chased out demons in your name. We healed people in your name. And Jesus says, I don't know you. See, even on the pulpit, we can, we can do a bunch of things. I faced a demon once in my life. I never want to have that opportunity again. I've prayed for sick people. Many of us who lead have done these things. And yet Jesus will come to some of us and say, but I don't know you. What about you? 
But Jesus, in your name, I came to church. In your name, I shared the gospel. In your name, I prayed. In your name, I did fill in the gap. And Jesus will say, I don't know you. Why is that? Because love, love, were you generous? Did you show tzedakah to those that could not repay you? Was your hand open to those that needed something? Or were you hoarding things for yourself? Jesus also tells the parable of a rich man that had too much and didn't fit into his storeroom. And he thought to himself, geez, what will I do? And he said, you know what? I'll pull down those storerooms and I'll be bigger storerooms. And I'll be safe. I won't have any worries. And Jesus says, you foolish man, tonight your life will be taken from you. Jesus even told the, the woman caught in adultery. That happens. You're forgiven. But don't do it again. Love God. But for this man, who just built bigger storerooms, he says, death. Seems a little out of balance, doesn't it? Generosity you start a righteousness, and being in right standing with God is crucial to our faith. And therefore, the weight of this. Principle three, our riches neither come from us nor is purposed for us. 2 Corinthians 9. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. There's a, there's a famine in Israel, and he is taking up an offering for the church in Jerusalem. And so speaking to the church in Corinth, who was a wealthy church, and he's challenging them to give generously. And so he says to them, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, the first one's easy. If you ever planted anything from flowers to, to any fruit trees or, or uh, vegetables, you would know that the amount of seed you put in the ground is multiplied and that's what you get back. Easy enough. You sow more, you're going to get more. Okay. Now, that, that scripture is used in a bunch of churches to raise money. Come on. There's a special anointing tonight for a thousand dollar gift. <laughs> that does not honor God. Might be funny, but it doesn't honor God. And that is not what the scripture says. So if you look at the gospel in this case, which is each of you should give what you've decided in your heart. If you look at the Old Testament, the law was written on stone tablets. And you were commanded to do. No option. If you didn't do, you had to sacrifice things. In the New Testament, Paul writes in Romans that the law is now written on our hearts. And now it's not the command anymore. It is you have the choice to do. You should freely choose. You cannot be commanded to follow Jesus. You have to choose. But then even in that, the loving God that we serve says you get to choose further. What did your walk with Him look like? He says choose. Be a cheerful giver. Why? God is able to bless you abundantly. So that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Ephesians says that God has already given you. He knows. He has purposed work for you to accomplish. Good works, says Ephesians. And then he gets to verse 10. He says, Now he who supplies seeds to the sower and bread for food 
also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Now note that God gives two things. He gives seed and he gives bread. He's giving you something that has to die in your hand because a seed that is not dead cannot go into the ground and bear fruit. It's a law of nature. A seed has to die. But it's also giving you something in your hand to put in your mouth. It's giving you both. But I think sometimes we confuse our bread and our seed. And we think everything's bread. And then we wonder why nothing's happening. See, if we read Scripture, there's no compulsion on God to increase your bread. But there's a promise from God to increase your seed. What does it mean? Your generosity begets generosity begets generosity. Your generosity, your tzedakah, will grow and continue to grow. And as long as you practice tzedakah, that will increase and increase. And then it says, so will your righteousness, your tzedak, before God. Who wants to be more righteous before God? Practice generosity. I know a man many years ago, um, I spoke about this morning, he wrote checks. So I'm pretty sure that some of you don't know what that is. <laughs> We're old, old, old people, Marinas. <laughs> <laughs> but he wrote the first check for 100 rand. He wrote the second check for 200 rand. 500, 1,000, 2,500, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, and 100,000 rand with no names in it. And he went before God and he says, God, I'm trusting you. I'm keeping you accountable to your word. I'm trusting you with 100 rand. Seed. Not bread. God gave him 100 rand and he sowed 100 rand. Then he went back to God and said, now I'm trusting you for 200 rand. Because your word says that if I'm generous and I practice tzedakah, then you will increase my tzedakah. And God gave him the 200 rand. And he filled in the name and he sowed the check. And so he has given every single check away except the 100,000 check. And if you speak to him, you'll say that he's still trusting God for a 100,000 rand check. Now, the 50,000 rand one wasn't a check. He sold his car. He sold his car. It was worth about 50,000 rand. So a lot of times we'll, we grow up and we, we buy the car, but then we have to upgrade the car, and we have to upgrade the car, and, we have to, and you get into a cycle of upgrading something that loses value as soon as you put your key into the door, not even to the ignition, you just put it in the door and you've lost like a thousand bucks. I want to urge you, as you, most of you, grow up into adulthood, won't you just maybe stop once in a while and ask God, should I upgrade or is this maybe seed? Is this something I should sow? Don't always keep. Don't always, why do we need to upgrade continuously? And build up these things around us. God says, I will increase your righteousness and I will increase your seed. Why? You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. What's the purpose of our giving? Thanksgiving to God. And it's the second time that he's gone through this list. He did the same in, um, in verse 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, verse 11, and through us, generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. God wants to increase your seed so you can meet the needs of others at every single occasion that comes across your path so that they can bless God. They can turn that into thanksgiving before God. 
It is the good works that He has prepared for us before the age of the earth. And then verse 12, this is a service that you perform. It's not only to supply seed of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Second time. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God. Third time. When the Bible repeats things, like Jesus saying, truly, truly, I say to you, it means they want to emphasize. Not twice this time, three times. Paul says, your generosity is about thanksgiving to God. So the first question right now is, how's your thanksgiving to God? When we start our connect groups with, what are we thankful for? It's just, ah, I'm just thankful for a new day. And that's okay if you just got an into Christianity and you just gave your heart to God and your life surrendered and you're like happy. But as you mature, there should be more substantial things. When I, when I teach my, my son to pray at night, we lie in bed, I'm like, okay, what are the, what's the one thing you want to thank God for? And if it's something benign, maybe tonight, but if he does it twice in a row, I'm like, no. Think about the story we read tonight. What did it teach you about God? And I say, thank you to God for that part of him. And then he's allowed to pray for someone for something. This is so that other people can call out to God in thanksgiving. For the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. So your confession of the gospel is the good work of generosity. That's what this verse says. Your generous act speaks the gospel, and therefore people will be thankful. And in their prayers for you, and their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. This is an act of grace. And then the last verse says, Thanks be to God for His inescribable gift. And what is that gift? For God so loved the world that He gave. God's gift. God's sadaka to us. It's principle four. Our giving is determined by understanding of God's giving. When's the last time you just paused at the gospel? Just paused, thought about it. The fact that Jesus chose to give. Not just his life. Jesus chose under no compulsion to sacrifice his Godhood. Philippians says, not counting equality with God. He gave. Why? So that those seated here could respond in thanksgiving to God. Exactly what we just read about finances we find in the life of God Himself. Not a compulsion gave freely so that we could gain. Those who could give nothing back in return except ourselves and therefore if you read Paul's letters he starts off by introducing himself as an apostle and by his last letters he calls himself a bond servant which means someone who sold himself into slavery not an apostle just someone who gave everything to the one who owns everything anyway and so Jesus showed us what Sadaka should look like and what it means to then be Sadak, righteous before God, so much so that he's, one of his names is literally righteousness. And so when we practice generosity, we step into that righteousness 
that is that of Jesus. So if we were to offer a righteous prayer, it would probably be something like, God, give me seed for sowing. And then give me the faith not to hold on to that seed, but to sow it. But then give me the grace to eat my bread without feeling guilty. See, then it doesn't matter if God gives you millions. Eat your bread. If that is the grace upon your life, bless you. Enjoy it without guilt. But have the faith to allow whatever is in your hand that God calls you to sow to die and then to let it fall to the ground. And if it is to die, it will die. But if God has purposed it to be raised, it will not only come to life, but it will multiply and grow and become more than you ever hoped and dreamed when you looked at it in your hand. And that might be money. Might be the career you've chosen. Might be that thing you are saving for that you are dreaming about. Might be that relationship. Not the guys that got engaged now. Other people. But what are you holding on to tightly? Because the only thing that we should hold on tightly is Jesus. The rest we should hold pretty loosely. Because it all belongs to Him. And I'd rather turn my hand and let things fall than having God force my hand open to take what is his anyway and so my question two questions that I end with tonight is this where are you practicing generosity I know some of you might go but I don't have much or maybe it's just buying an ice cold coke once a month for the car guard 12 bucks maybe that's what you've got maybe that's it maybe it's just buying a bread for someone and that's it that's what you've got and you can give so out of your own free will give so generously and you'll be cheerful about it God will bless that that'll be tzedakah maybe God is calling you to do more then do more Maybe you're stuck in debt. Well, you can come chat to me, you can chat to Marinus, you can chat to the elders. We have counseled people out of debt. Then get out of debt so you can be generous. But where are you practicing generosity? So when you tithe, we believe the tithe comes to the church. That's what we believe as every, what we believe as every nation. And that tithe pays for what you have today. It pays for this instrument, it pays for the desk, it pays for Marina's salary, it pays for the offering. It does not need to come to the church. If you are giving to family because they are on hard times, that's the duck. The Bible says if you can't look after your family, you're worse off than in heathen. So then bless your family, help them, sow there. If you have places you're giving, bless you. Thank you. You are in right standing with God because of those acts of loving kindness. You're walking in faith. If you're not sowing but you don't know where to sow, we have some great things. You can partner with Reach, which is helping us plant churches. Hansi that was here a couple of weeks ago, he's there because of Reach. If you say, well, I don't want to partner with a church, I want to partner with a faith. Well, there's ministry partnership. I'm on ministry partnership. Bianca that we're sending to Linwood's ministry partnership. Adelia is on ministry partnership. All our staff, except our senior leader, ministry partnership. People that partner with us on a monthly basis so that we can do the work of ministry. Or if you feel it's the widows and the orphans, we have a baby haven in Linwood. We also have Just Home, which is part of us. You can speak to Anne, who runs the kids' ministry. Place of safety, her house. 
we also have a, a man in the morning. There's an NGO that in Silverton that helps blind people to have a work, to have a purpose, to earn an income. You'll partner with them. And if you partner with Just Home or, or with Dion's NGO, you can get tax benefits. It's an extra little bonus. There are places all around us if we just open our eyes and listen when the Holy Spirit speaks to us. All of us can give. You don't have to save the world and give everything. Start with a little, like that one person that wrote a check for 100 rand. Maybe your first is 10 rand. Then start with 10 and trust for the 100. But let's start somewhere. My second question is, when we stand before the king one day, are you standing on the left or on the right? Is he going to say to you that you gave to me because you gave unto others? Or will you be the ones that are cursed and have no inheritance? So what a challenge is we go into the week. Stop. Even if you have to put a reminder on your phone, take times to stop and just meditate on the gospel and what was generously given to you so that you might have everything for all eternity. Stop and meditate on the gospel. If you do that, you will steward the gospel generously. You will steward your life generously. You will steward your finances generously because you cannot meditate on the gospel and live an unchanged life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you showed us generosity, that you gave your son so that we may live. And Jesus, the same, you gave your Godhood. You gave your unity, your loving relationship with the Father, sacrificed that on the cross and walked alone for the first time in all eternity so that we would have an inheritance. We thank you. We bless you. Jesus. And Father, I pray that your word will be governed by the Holy Spirit, that this word will keep on preaching, that people will always remember to practice tzedakah so that they could be to duck in your presence and Father I pray that as they sow seeds that you will honor your word and you will increase their seed I pray that you will give them wisdom to know what is seed and what is bread but Father I know that your word also says that you know every heart's desire so Father I pray that you will not only increase the seed but as they stand righteous before you won't you meet the desires of their heart as well but most of all, Lord, I pray that as we go out and steward the grace that has been given to us, that where we step, there will be thanksgiving unto God. In the name of Jesus, I pray this. Amen.